Well, I think I think we'll get started now. Um, some other people may be joining later. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this is Tom Armitage uh, with the Science Advisory Board Office. Uh, I'm the designated federal officer for the EPA Science Advisory Board. And I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the Science Advisory Board. It is a continuation of the uh, meeting that we began on Tuesday, May 31st. Um, before I turn the meeting over to the chair of the Science Advisory Board, Dr. Cullen, I would like to just take the role of SAB members present. So please indicate that you're here when I call your name. Dr. Allison Cullen. Present. Dr. Marjorie Aileon. Present. Dr. Dave Allen. Dr. Susan Annenberg. Present. Dr. Florence Anuro. Present. Dr. Joe Arvai. Dr. Barbara Beck. Present. Dr. Roland Benke. Present. Dr. Tammy Bond. Present. Dr. Mark Borsak. Present. Dr. Sylvie Bruder. Present. Dr. Jay Chakraborty. Present. Dr. Amin Chen. Present. Dr. Amy Childress. Dr. Wei Su Chu. Dr. Ryan Emanuel. Present. Mr. Earl Fordham. Dr. John Guckenheimer. Present. Dr. Steve Hamburg. Dr. Marcus Hendricks. Dr. Celine Hernandez Ruiz. Present. Dr. Alina Irwin. Dr. Dave Kaiser. Dr. Mark Le Chevalier. Present. Dr. Angela Lung. Ms. Lisa Lonefight. Present. Dr. Lala Ma. Present. Dr. John Morris. Present. Dr. Enid Neptune. Dr. Sheila Olmsted. Present. Dr. Austin Omer. Present. Dr. Gloria Post. Present. Dr. Christy Pullen Fednick. Dr. Amanda Rodewald. Present. Dr. Emma Rossi. Present. Dr. John Samet. Present. Dr. Leanne Shepard. Dr. Drew Schindel. Present. Dr. Janice Smith. Dr. Richard Smith. Present. Dr. Daniel Stram. Present. Dr. Peter Thorne. Present. Dr. Godfrey Uzer Chukwu. Present. Dr. Wei Sung Wang. Present. Dr. June Weintraub. Present. Dr. Sakobi Wilson. Dr. Dominic van der Mensbrug. Present. Great. Oh, and the board liaisons. Dr. Daniel Schlenk. Dr. Robert Chapin. Dr. Dina Schur. Dr. Paul Gilman. Great, thank you very much. And Tom, uh, so, yes, and this is Enid, so I just joined. Oh, great, thank you very much. And hi, Tom, it's Amy Childress. I also joined after you called my name. Okay, great, thank you very much, Amy. Thank you. So, with that, I'm now going to turn the meeting over to Dr. Allison Cullen, Chair of the Science Advisory Board. Thanks so much and good afternoon and good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to the second day of this meeting of the Chartered EPA Science Advisory Board. 
The first day of the meeting was on Tuesday this week, May 31st. We have one item on the agenda for today's meeting. I would really like to complete our discussion of the SAB Waters of the US Work Group's draft report. On Tuesday, we discussed the first three topics in the WOTUS Work Group draft report. So we covered topics 1A and 1B, subsurface connections, and review of the scientific evidence of connectivity, and also topic two, economic analysis. Today, we will turn to discussion um, of responses to charge questions under topics three and four, climate change science and environmental justice. And then we're also going to discuss the key points in the letter to the administrator um, that's in the report that we would then transmit to the administrator after the SAB makes any changes they wish. Uh, I wanna note that we heard public comments on May 31st. Today, there'll be an opportunity near the end of the meeting to hear brief clarifying public comments. The purpose for that short session is to hear approximately two minute comments from members of the public concerning points that were raised at the meeting. If any member of the public wishes to provide short clarifying comments, please send an email to the designated federal officer, Tom Armitage, before we begin discussion of the letter to the administrator. Tom Armitage's email address is on the SAB meeting website. Are there any questions from SAB members before we begin? Don't see any. All right, so we will first turn to discussion of topic three, climate change science. Uh, I would like to ask Drs. Drew Shindell and Ryan Emanuel to begin the discussion. They'll be summarizing the work group's responses to charge questions 3A and 3B. And Dr. Olmsted, before they start, would you like to address any comments to the group? Um, I don't have any comments. I just wondered whether we wanna read the charge questions first. Go ahead. On the slides, if that's useful. That's great. Okay, so we can just go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Shindell. Great. So I'm going to start right in and, and summarize uh, 3A and 3B. And I saw Ryan, uh, Dr. Emanuel is on the on the call as well, and we'll we'll chime in. So the charge question, just to to remind you. Um, is actually a very long sentence for the first question. So is, to summarize, it's essentially asking, uh, it's saying that the proposed rule discusses how the significant nexus standard allows for the con consideration of the function of the small bodies of water um, in affecting how the large bodies of water respond to climate change. So naturally the preamble talks about how the large bodies of water and the small bodies are both affected by climate change. We were asked to comment on the extent to which that discussion of climate impacts is technically accurate. And to summarize our response, it's just a couple paragraphs. We essentially found that the, the preamble discussion was largely correct. Uh, the one, one thing we pointed out and thought was worthwhile pointing out to the EPA was that they, they really rely on very kind of simplified discussion of climate change and that areas tend to get wetter or drier, whereas they leave out that under climate change, in fact, areas can become both wetter and drier. So we suggested that they might want to consider expanding to talk about non-stationarity and changes in extremes as well as changes in, in mean state. The only um, point that we found that was technically inaccurate was a statement about storm surges not being more frequent. And we uh, believe that storm surges, the evidence shows that storm surges are not necessarily becoming more frequent, but stronger and higher so that they could either point that out or note that extreme surges extreme storm surges are becoming more frequent. Other than that, we, we thought that the preamble generally did a good job of, of technically summarizing the effects of climate change on the hydrologic cycle. Shall I, I've, I've forgotten how we did this on Tuesday. I think we generally went one question at a time. So maybe I would just stop there on 3A and ask uh, if Dr. Emanuel has comments to add, and then maybe we open it up before going on to 3B, if that's all right. That sounds terrific. Thank you, Dr. Shindell. Uh, I, I don't have any comments to add. That was a good synopsis of, um, um, of the discussion and the write-up. Thanks, both of you. So then we can open it up to discussions, comments, questions from the board. It looks like, Steve Hamburg, you've got your hand up. 
Great, thanks. And I apologize, I haven't dug in to answer this, my own question. So Drew, I'll let you do that. Um, uh, the, there is evidence that base flow um, it, it does change. Is that reflected there? So that has a lot of implications in, in, in ways that aren't always intuitive based on changes in evapotranspiration and some of the hydrologic processes. So um, is that reflected in the assumptions or is that an issue? Steve, did you say base river flow? Yes. Is that what you mean? Well, no, it wouldn't be base river flow, just be base flow in, in hydrologic systems. There's some first order watershed work that's shown that shifting in base flow uh, associated with uh, just the fact that uh, the hydrologic cycle is shifting for the reasons you said, it's getting more and less, but counterintuitively, sometimes the base flow is actually increasing despite the, 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 the less uh, static nature of overall rainfall patterns. Right. Yeah, I, I agree that there is evidence of that. And I, without looking back, I, I don't remember if that was in the preamble, but I see Ryan's hand up, so maybe he will. No. Yeah, I will just jump in to say, um, at the risk of not having the preamble right in front of me, um, I do remember that there is language about uh, base flow in the, the preamble that was published in the Federal Register. And I can, I can track that down or we can, um, uh, we can agree to have somebody look at that. Yeah, I just want to make sure that it's there because of that change for exactly the reason you said in the other way is to make sure they recognize that that's a critical factor. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have other comments on this charge question? I don't see any. Maybe we'll move to, uh, let's see, is it 3B then? And then we can always uh, circle back if there's something more general about all of three. That sounds, sounds good. Okay, so charge question 3B is a bit long, so I will try to summarize again. Uh, I should start by saying that charge question 3B is actually two questions. And it is, the first one is a little bit of overlap with 3A, but it's referring to a different portion of the technical support document. We're out of the preamble now, and it, it talks about how the technical support document again talks about how climate change can affect water resources and we were asked to comment in this first portion on the extent to which it's technically accurate and uh, it, to which it explains the importance of considering no, i can't read that bit um considering functions of streams and wetlands and so to start there i have the responses numbered down below as well the first two relate to this first question. And again, as with the, the preamble language, we found that generally the, the material, uh, the text was technically accurate. There's a little star there to remind me that there was a, a, a grammatical issue, perhaps one would call it. It's kind of like when Tuesday we were talking about the use of the word ephemeral. This, in this case, it was the use of the word flashy, which I learned to my... Uh, edification did not just mean bright clothes and lots of jewelry and such, but it had a hydrologic cycle meeting. So there's a little uh, edit suggested there. Aside from that, we, we generally liked the way that the return to the significant nexus standard was framed uh, in the document as well as being accurate, but it, it explained the importance well, we thought of doing this. And one of the things that's important is that it allows flexibility, including to account for change in extremes. And that was important both because you remember, we just talked about extremes in response to question 3A, but this also comes up in the second part of the, the question of 3B here. The only small detail, just like in, in 3A, there was one small technical um, correction we would like, which is that hurricanes, much as storm surges, not necessarily more frequent, but the most intense hurricanes are more frequent. When we get to part two, the question there is, is talking about a typical year and how the previous rule, the navigable waters protection rule, um, did not allow for fully evaluating the effects of climate change because of this typical year definition. And so the expanded uh, the new update proposed would allow for consideration of other 
metrics other than the kind of traditional typical year. So again, that's that's kind of con um, connected to the first part of the question about why it's important to go back to this standard. And uh, as I mentioned, and the text says there, it allows flexibility for changes in extremes. We uh, So the response to two is generally the second part is that we agree that the use of a typical year can be problematic. And we had a, an actually pretty interesting discussion about this within our little WOTUS working group and that we wanted to not just say something's problematic and which is easy to do and not point out any solution. So in the response, we also have some examples of how to go beyond typical year in ways that, that seem appropriate to account for rapid climate change, including a, a NOAA definition that is being used for, for precipitation and an IPCC example applied to temperature um, so, so that we can point out other ways of rather than just taking an average over the last 30 years and getting a typical year. That I think is hopefully a good short summary and but I'll turn again and see if, if Dr. Emanuel has any anything to chime in. Thank you. The only thing I would like to add is that uh, uh, I just want to affirm that the technical support document actually does a good job of talking about the impacts of hydrologic extremes. And so just to link this back to 3A, if I may, the idea was just to elevate um, some of that discussion up to the preamble and take it out of the technical support document. That's all. Thank you both. I'll open this up then to the full board. Any suggestions or changes needed to their response document? Anything on 3A or 3B, climate change science? Uh, let's see, Dr. Guckenheimer. Uh, Dr. I, have a, uh, I have a general question about our response, uh, which is that uh, in IPCC reports, uh, there has been growing attention to the prospect of um, regime shifts, critical transitions, tipping points, whatever you want to call them, but very rapid changes that uh, occur that really move the system into uh, different states than had been observed before. And uh, is the question that I have is, is whether that's something that we should raise in our response uh, to the EPA on, on WOTUS. Interesting question. Uh, Dr. Shindel or Emmanuel, would you like to field that one? Can also open it up to Dr. Olmsted. Well, just briefly, I would have no objection to say pointing out that indeed, you know, as as we just heard, that they, the possibility of nonlinear changes in regime shifts is, is a real one, and, and there's lots of evidence to support that. I'm not sure. I mean, I guess I wouldn't feel strongly about it because I'm not sure that the EPA could necessarily do anything about it because those, th those kinds of things are very hard to project or, or quantify and with any confidence. So... To my mind, it's less important than say Dr. Emanuel's point about you know really elevating these change in extremes because those we actually do believe we can really project and start to use in our planning and such. So I agree that it that that's a real issue. I guess I have mixed. Uh, I, I don't have a particularly strong feeling about whether to recommend that or not. It sounds like the suggestion is that we would acknowledge that. Um, in light of you know IPC and C and others, um, you know it, it's uh, it's an issue. Not necessarily that we're saying that EPA should do something specific, but Dr. Guckenheimer, don't let me put words in your mouth if that's not what you were intending. If you had something more specific, yeah, we would probably be good to raise that here. Um, I don't think I had anything more specific, but um, 
the I think that the, the place where perhaps this comes most into play with regard to WOTUS um, is uh, with the issue of droughts and the difficulty in sustaining water supplies, uh, particularly in the western half of the country. So we've been handling uh, suggestions as if folks would like to send you know, suggested language on sort of clarifying points and, and points made for completeness and sort of acknowledging scope and things like that. Um, language can be sent to the DFO. If there's something more specific that we're trying to go for, then it, it is good to hammer it out a bit more here, but it seems like we're in the first category unless I'm misunderstanding. Uh, Dr. Olmsted, are you hearing similarly that this? I am. I think probably the best approach to addressing this particular comment would be to just come back to the preamble, skim, skim through it again, see the degree to which these issues are mentioned and whether Dr. Schindel and Emmanuel are, you know, sort of would give the thumbs up to the way, uh, right, that it's, it's currently addressed uh, and, and Dr. Guggenheimer as well. And then if there is a, you know, a suggested change, you know, to expand that discussion by a sentence or two, then we could take text for that. That sounds great. Uh, let's see, I will turn to Dr. Smith, but we can also return to this one if someone wants to say more on it. Dr. Smith, you've been waiting. Yeah, yeah, just a very, very quick technical point, but there was a discussion of 30-year of averages, somebody said towards the end of that presentation. Um, and I completely agree that the notion of a typical year is, is somewhat artificial because climate has been changing continuously over the last century. But my specific question um, is that somewhere in the last year or so, I can't remember exactly when it was, NOAA did do its 10-year update of, of 30 year averages. And I just wondered if that had been taken into account. Yeah, that was in the past year, wasn't it? Uh, Dr. Emanuel, Dr. Schindel, any thoughts on that? Well, as I, I, do, I do remember seeing that, that they redid the 30 year updates. We, but that would still be, I mean, that would be an updated version of still the standard definition of the of the typical year so what we what the the technical support unit no sorry technical support document talks about um and we mentioned in our responses that noaa has created a product that's based on a shorter time interval to try to so to complement their 30 years, including the updated 30 years. And that one then only looks over, I'm remembering right, it's the past 15 to try to give a more current sense. I think they felt they couldn't go to shorter time periods, um, but that that was a way to capture uh, hydrologic cycle variability during a period of rapid change. And so that's both in the technical support document and highlighted in our response as an option for a way to get a, a little more updated version of normalcy. So it's not exactly what you're saying, but it's another similar NOAA effort. Yeah, oh, okay, thanks. That, that completely answers my question. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of those issues, but you obviously are, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Other suggestions or possible changes for topic three, either question A or B. Uh, Dr. Thorne, you're on mute. <laughs> the NOAA document, or the NOAA 15 year seasonal average that we were just talking about, is that it seems like you're only recommending that for precipitation, not for temperature. And I wonder if they also have that for temperature. And it seems like temperature is also quite extreme in the last 15 years compared to the 30 year average. Yeah, good question. I don't know if it's for both temperature and precipitation. Does someone else have better information about that? This was, I think, just in the past year. It wasn't long ago, is my recollection. I uh, don't think we have anyone else who's got I, something. I, to 
I don't believe it's mentioned in the technical support document anyway, but that doesn't necessarily tell us whether it exists. So that I think you raised a good point, Dr. Thorne. We could we could check for that. I mean, I would I would agree with you too that one of our other examples that is in the response is IPCC analysis of temperature that in fact says the change in you know, at least in large area average is so monotonic that you can take a 30 year average around the present, including projected changes, and then you have the most up-to-date possible, right? Because you're actually centered around now. Um, so temperature is, is in our response, but that's a good, I think a good thing to check. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on topic three? All right, I don't see any more hands. So seeing none, the next item on our agenda is the session of topic four. This would be environmental justice science. And we'll be discussing Drs. Jay Chakraborty, Dr. Ryan Emanuel, and Dr. Lala Ma. And I don't know if you have a particular order you want to go in. Uh, Dr. Please... Chakraborty is going gonna, is gonna to go first. Okay, great. So, yeah, so you may begin the discussion and summarize the response to charge questions 4A and 4B. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering if you could get the slides. Love it. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scullin and Dr. Olmsted. Uh, and good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending on your geographic location. So as you can see from question 4A, environmental justice or EJ is discussed in both the technical support and economic analysis documents. And part of economic analysis, actually section five uh, covers the tribal impact analysis. So uh, I think starting with the first one, section 3D of the technical support document devotes about one page to introducing the EJ impacts of the proposed rule. And our subgroup felt that it provides an effective and useful overview of various uh, unequal impacts of the rule on socially disadvantaged groups and tribal communities. Now, the economic analysis uh, section or section four provides a more detailed uh, quantitative assessment of the potential uh, spatial impacts of changes uh, due to the proposed rule for populations of concern, again, using the baseline of the NWPR. And uh, the, these results are summarized in four tables for the EJ screening analysis and two maps for the tribal impact analysis. Uh, next slide, please. And here are two examples of the tables that focus on wetland area changes and changes to affected waters respectively. So as you can see, this screening analysis includes uh, seven variables relevant to EJ, which appear as columns of the tables. And the analysis is kind of based on comparing these values across uh, four watersheds or four uh, HUC-12 hydrologic unit code you know, boundaries uh, and four scenarios. So our subgroup felt that the methodology used is generally sound and results are ex explained with adequate clarity. Although a more rigorous analysis may be necessary and some of the analytical assumptions could be better justified. So overall, for charge question 4A, we identified several issues that require further clarification and consideration, uh, which we then used to develop uh, nine recommendations. And I thought it would be easier to use these tables to uh, summarize and illustrate our nine recommendations, starting with the next slide. Thank you. So number one, it was a bit unclear to us how these four scenarios or categories listed in the first columns of these tables were developed or derived and why the watershed area changes or changes to affected areas were classified into these specific categories. So I, we felt that uh, it would be helpful to know this because the results of the EJ analysis could be sensitive to the values used as cutoffs for this classification. So some explanation or justification would be helpful. Uh, num uh, number two, or next slide. Uh, we felt that the EJ analysis could benefit from a more detailed assessment of the 96 watersheds that had wetland changes of more than 50 acres under the proposed rule. Now, uh, we do understand that these watersheds represent uh, only 0.2% or a small fraction of the national uh, total, but uh, you'll notice how this row indicates a very large overrepresentation of uh, minority and low income populations and other socially disadvantaged groups when compared to the national average. So uh, we recommend a more detailed investigation of these areas or, or watersheds uh, before drawing definitive conclusions about the, the EG implications of the proposed rule. 
Uh, next slide. Uh, this screening analysis, as you can see from the tables, was based on comparing the percentage of individuals in specific socio demographic categories like minority, low income, low education, etc., to their corresponding national average. And while this is easy to follow and understand, we felt that using the overall US percentage for comparison could lead to double counting of communities within the watersheds since the national percentage for any variable includes areas both inside and outside the watershed. So a more appropriate, probably a better approach would be to estimate and compare the percentage of each variable inside the area defined by these watersheds versus the area outside or rest of the US, as a lot of quantitative EJ studies in the academic literature has, has done. Uh, next slide. And on a related note, uh, we, uh, we had a fair bit of discussion on this. Uh, it, uh, we, uh, we thought it would be more useful to use state level social demographic averages also as a comparison metric rather than the national average. Uh, this could be more complicated computationally, but I think we identified at least three reasons for this recommendation. Uh, number one, national average, the average can mask you know, considerable heterogeneity across uh, uh, geographic regions that make make the comparison less useful or valid. And second, the state level comparison may better match the regulatory level at which our environmental decisions or permitting decisions are made. And third, state level comparison would be more consistent with previous EPA analysis that use state level comparisons like the, I think it's the 2015 steam electric rule and several others. Uh, next slide. Now, the economic analysis document acknowledges that aggregating all individuals who are essentially not non-Hispanic white into a single minority category for EJ analysis is problematic and will be addressed in their future plans. However, it was unclear to us if the minority category used in this analysis also includes individuals belonging to an American tribe, since these two variables appear in separate columns uh, you know, in all the tables, including the ones uh, that you can see here. Uh, next slide. And uh, the inferences uh, drawn from these uh, tables in the economic analysis document are not supported by any uh, statistical tests. And uh, even if we are using national averages for comparison, an appropriate test, uh, like two sample Z test of proportions or something could be included uh, just to establish if any of the observed percentage differences from the national average are significantly uh, different from zero. So instead of just talking about numerical differences, you know, support these by using statistical tests. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, I mean, another issue I think we found here is that uh, the, the population characteristics of watershed summarized in these tables were estimated using the proportion of the area of census boundaries, sometimes tracks, sometimes census block groups, and that intersect with the watershed boundaries. And this approach assumes that individuals in all these uh, social categories are equally or uniformly distributed across space, you know, within these census units, not very realistic or accurate. And it's good, it's a good first step, but now we have uh, like several GIS based aerial interpolation techniques uh, that can address these limitations, such as in using population weighted centroids or, you know, asymmetric mapping that use uh, aerial photography. So it's useful to explore these techniques uh, to get a more accurate estimate of the actual population within watershed boundaries compared to the approach used here, uh, you know, for future analysis. Uh, next slide, please. So moving on now to our recommendations for uh, tribal impact analysis. Now, this was essentially a qualitative assessment of the overlap between tribal area boundaries, which are shown in red or pink on this map and proposed changes in wetland area and affected waters. So essentially a visual comparison of two map layers. And we felt that this assessment could be more effective and useful if tables were included to summarize the area or aerial extent of overlap with tribal area boundaries for each watershed change scenario. Similar to what you saw in some of the previous slides, you know, uh, similar to what was done for the screening analysis tables or some quantitative measures can be included to support this map-based, uh, essentially visual assessment. Uh, next slide. Our final recommendation, now we felt that the discussion of cultural characteristics in the rule is a bit limited based on uh, uh, indigenous communities relationship with the water. 
And uh, uh, one more than 30 tribes listed in the ES supplement have statements of cultural or spiritual significance of water now built into the regulatory frameworks. And these statements emphasize, for example, how uh, disconnection from these cultural and spiritual uses of water can have negative impact on indigenous people's health and well being. So some of these impacts could be included. They're not well captured by the current language of the proposed rule. So that's all I have for question 4A, unless Dr. Emmanuel or Ma would like to add something to my summary. Otherwise, I look forward to your comments and suggestions. Thank you, Dr. Emmanuel, Dr. Ma, anything to add? Thank you, Dr. Chakraborty. I don't have any um, additions to that synopsis. I don't either, thank you, that was great. Yeah, thanks to the three of you. Uh, so opening this up to the whole group then, are there any suggestions or changes for uh, topic and charge question 4A? I see Dr. Hernandez Ruiz. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for um, the presentation, very informative, and it really helps out to have like those tables and maps and, and being able to visualize it, right? At least it is for me, so thank you so much. Um, one question that I had um, is in regards to what are the potential benefits that would be expected by not lumping together some of these minority groups, if I heard correctly? That was one of the recommendations. Yeah. Uh... Should I go ahead and answer that? Or? Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, I think the idea here is that when you uh, group uh, or lump many different subcategories into a single category, uh, the effects and impacts are equal and uniform for all groups, which may not be the case, especially given their you know, regional distribution or variation, the areas in which Hispanic populations are overrepresented compared to non-Hispanic Blacks, et cetera. So I think it's, uh, uh, for any national scale analysis, that's always an issue. If you break this down, we might discover uh, you know, uh, higher levels of impacts for some groups compared to others. And it was really good to see, uh, which is kind of, uh, which overlaps with question 4B, part of the agency's plans would be to uh, you know, disaggregate uh, this category into relevant subcategories and see how the impacts differ. So in a way it's already covered, but uh, we are more concerned in terms of the screen because Native American tribes are listed separately. And the census definition of uh, minority, which is used here, which comes, I think, from the executive order of way back in 1994, the Environmental Justice, the original Environmental Justice Executive Order, their Native Americans are included. So I think here we are not exactly sure if they have been counted twice or you know or separated because the Native American tribe population uh, data comes from a slightly different source than the U.S. Census or American Community Survey. So just helpful to know you know, that, that uh, whether they're, well, how they overlap, thanks. Thanks for that additional detail. Dr. Hernandez Ruiz, anything further? Yes, uh, no, I think it's a great answer. Um, and um, another question is, with the current political climate, you know, there's probably an underestimation of some of this um, unrepresented minorities. Um, so I was just wondering if if there's any anything that um, we can include to try to address that uncertainty. Any thoughts from the topic for folks about either things to note or where you've already, I, I see that you've done some noting of, of related related to that. Could I just ask um, Dr. Hernandez Ruiz to clarify, do, are you talking about um, some uncertainty around maybe uh, kind of under underreporting, right, uh, in the census. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any responses from the subgroup? Yeah, just to uh, follow up on that, I think uh, this analysis was based on. American Community Survey data for 2018, which was before the pandemic. I know that uh, the last two American Community Surveys were severely hampered by low response rates and smaller sample sizes. So uh, it would be worse if the current uh, ACS uh, or the census were used. But in this case, I think the analysis was from the data set previously. So, you know, which, you know, not a good answer to your question, but you know, we have to, if you document that, we might want to clarify that as well. Thank you. 
Let's see, we have an additional hand up, uh, Dr. Izo Chakwu. Yes, I just want clarification on how you collect data from tribal areas. Are you, are you referring to reservations versus other areas where you have minority and low income groups? So how do you, how do you explain the tribal areas? Is it the reservations? Yeah, I think uh, if you uh, look at section five of the economic analysis, uh, uh, the, the document lists where the tribal area boundaries are obtained from and which definitions they're used. So that part I think is clarified there. And uh, yeah, I don't just have it in front of me, but yeah, I can look it up and, and yeah, get back to you. But they well, do well, mention fairly cl clearly, I think the data source and, and assumptions and limitations of that. What of where they are mixed? Because sometimes you may have a concentration of a certain group, but as you go, people become more dilute. You have a mixture of low-income Native Americans, African Americans, other groups. So, and somebody was talking about the, how do you explain such data if that is the case? And yes, uh, I think that here uh, for this uh, report, it was defined by the US census uh, data sets and it's called uh, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian areas and geographic boundaries. So they kind of use uh, uh, that definition and the rest of the analysis is consistent with that. But uh, if you're thinking in terms of the limitations of doing that, yeah, that's certainly, you know, that can be discussed. I don't know if someone else can add, wants to add to that. If I may offer a, a brief clarification on that, the, I, I believe that that data layer includes reservation lands, trust lands, as well as the category state designated tribal statistical areas. But you know that we know that the majority of American Indian and Alaska Native population in the United States is now urban as of the last census or two. And those urban areas are generally not, not captured in the EPA's analysis of uh, what they're calling tribal areas. Thanks, Dr. Emanuel. And then um, uh, I just have one minor thing to add, which is so to the point about, you know, maybe some of these areas also coincide with low income areas. I think this um, some of the recommendations um, that we had was to kind of uh, um, increase, increase the rigor of some of the analysis. So you'd be able to kind of control for different uh, account for different factors of a location. Um, you know, comparing two places with same income, what is the difference in the, uh, you know, racial, ethnic breakdown? Um, and so that I think uh, would be something that would could be could be done with an analysis that's a little bit more rigorous than just kind of looking at mean comparisons. It goes back to that disaggregation comment too, I think. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Ma. Uh, Dr. Uh, Alien. Yes. Uh I want to thank the subcommittee for a really thorough response. And I have one question on your recommendation number four, where you're doing or suggesting the comparison with the state averages versus the national averages. And I understand and agree with your rationale for that. But I guess what my question is, is there any benefit to looking at both the state and national to do both? Because they should provide, and I would think, some kind of different information. And um, I don't know if that was considered. It sounded like there was a pretty good discussion on the point of whether to select state or national comparison, uh, given the heterogeneity of, of some of the US states in different regions of the country. Thanks for the question. <clears throat> Is the topic four team ready to respond? Uh, Dr. Ma, would you like to respond to that? Sure. Uh, yes, I, I mean, I, I think the comment, or at least I, inter I you know, I, I think it's the idea is to have also um, the, the state level as a, right, that's, that's a question whether to include the national and the state. Um, and I think it would make sense to include both. Yeah. 
Thank you. And just as a quick follow up to that, I did mention at least verbally that can be computationally more complicated because some of these watershed areas cross state boundaries or you know cover more than one state, and that's where the comparison with the state average you have to figure out you know the as the majority of the watershed falling into one state or or, or a percentage allocation. So uh, yeah, I mean it's a recommendation, but we understand that the complexities of doing that and additional assumptions that might be you know built into the analysis. I make a suggestion that in response to the comment and the subcommittee's response, one thing we could do would be that that second full bullet on page 19, which suggests the state level averages as an alternative, like sort of it may be more appropriate to use. We could sort of just modify that language to make it suggest as an, uh, just an additional, um, you know, an additional analysis. So uh, not a substitute, but a complement. Right. That's that's. Uh, exactly. Well said. <laughs> and and that's a really great point, actually, because if you do do if you do do the two levels of analyses and you find the that there's significant differences, um, that just kind of makes the point of uh, additional heterogeneity at this disaggregated level. Right. And and I also thinking it through to exactly that next step then making some type of suggestion of what would you actually select? If you have a big difference in the two, what would be the next steps that might be taken? Um, or how would you select one over the other? Exactly. Thank you for answering. Thanks for that comment. Anyone else with a suggestion or a change or a question? I don't see any. Uh, our next action was to look point by point at the letter to the EPA administrator. I want to turn quickly to- uh, Sorry, the, I think Dr. Chuck Bovardi was gonna go through charge question 4B. Oh yeah, sorry, I am in the wrong place. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So this we saw in a way, it's an extension of uh, charge question 4A and uh, in terms of uh, plans for the future uh, and uh, and we felt that the plans to broaden the scope of EJ analysis and the tribal impact analysis are adequate and promising. And they do address some of the limitations of the screening analysis that we just discussed in, in our responses to question 4A. And some of these future plans include consideration of additional environmental risk factors, use of case studies for more detailed assessments of downstream effects of wetland area changes, which can be really useful, as well as uh, the one we already discussed, the segregation of the minority category into relevant racial ethnic you know, subgroups. And we came up with uh, eight recommendations to further develop or enhance these plans. Uh, I don't have any slides or illustrations for these recommendations, but I'll try to quickly summarize them uh, verbally. So uh, number one, uh, we strongly support the inclusion of air pollution exposure and other environmental indicators from the EPA's uh, EJ screen mapping and screening tool, you know, as mentioned in this document. However, we also feel it's important to examine other risk factors and secondary uh, indicators that could be more relevant, especially in rural areas affected by the proposed rule. So, uh, for example, data on drinking water infrastructure and availability, uh, surface or groundwater quality, even animal feeding operations and pesticide drift, uh, underground presence of underground storage tanks could be considered in future plans. And number two, uh, for the more detailed assessments of downstream effects, you know, the case studies should attempt to include the colonias, uh, which are you know, low-income uh, immigrant communities uh, near the U.S.-Mexico border area. And in addition to inadequate infrastructure and housing, colonias uh, are often burdened by stressors such as contaminated drinking water and you know, low access to clean water, also prone to seasonal flash flooding. So that could be considered. And number three, and I think this overlaps with our recommendation seven for question 4A, uh, use the uh, estimate population or socio-demographic characteristics of watersheds uh, using more recent and reliable GIS-based aerial interpolation techniques that could provide more accurate estimates, as mentioned previously. And number four, I think we felt that the, uh, the screening analysis and plans uh, 
presented here focus almost exclusively on distributional environmental justice or the spatial uh, distribution of the potential impacts. But the EPS defini definition of EJ also includes you know, meaningful Im involvement of people and equal access to decision making. So these plans would consider uh, participatory and procedural justice issues in addition to uh, going beyond uh, distributional justice. And number five, again, going back to the case studies uh, that seek to analyze downstream effects, it would be useful to clarify the criteria that will be used to select these case studies. And number six, uh, again, the current screening, uh, screening analysis shows the socio-demographic characteristics by changes in affected waters or wetland area, as you saw in those tables. But it would also be useful to show the distribution of, of impacts in terms of the dollar value of the benefits. So for example, if the net benefits can be uh, broken down by geography, one could then relate average benefits to the social characteristics in that location. And this would also make uh, this part more consistent with the economic analysis carried out in, I think, Section 3C of, of the economic analysis document. And number seven, again, this overlaps with one of our recommendations, I think recommendation number eight. Uh, the tribal impact analysis is just a visual inspection of two overlapping map layers, as I just discussed. Uh, the inspection identifies between two to four states where tribal lands are likely to be impacted. So we are not sure if this approach is accurate enough or precise enough to evaluate the impacts to tribal na uh, nations. So it would be helpful at least to place all HUC 12 watersheds into two groups based on, based on whether or not they intersect with tribal area boundaries. And this would help formulate statistical tests to determine whether or not changes are significantly different for tribal versus non-tribal areas. And finally, I think uh, this was noted in our uh, discussion about charge question 2B on Tuesday, uh, that the tribal impact analysis indicates substantial effects on wetland acreage in uh, several states for which the economic analysis included zero effects, like I think Florida and maybe Minnesota as well, uh, based on predicting state responses to the rules. So, if the economic analysis is revised or extended to include all states, you know, as our work group had recommended, uh, this kind of mismatch could be addressed. And that would also be another way to make sure that state impacts in the EJ and tribal impact analysis are consistent with the economic analysis. So that's all I have for question 4B. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Dr. Emanuel, Dr. Ma, anything to add to that? Uh, no additions. Thank you for that, Dr. Chakraborty. I don't have any other. Thanks. Thanks. So let's open up then to the group and see if there are other suggestions or changes for this part of the work group response. Uh, let's see, Dr. Wilson. Yeah, I just wanted to just to comment. I, I, did, I did like the ideas about expanding the kind of the indicator focus to looking at rural areas, uh, colonias, bringing in agricultural impacts. Uh, I would say also thinking about um, drinking well water use, age of wells, if you get that data, but it's probably not great, uh, recharge data. Uh, also data on septic system use because some septic systems could be sources of contamination uh, for the well water and also the local uh, reser there's reservoir water. Uh, and then I wanted to say that um, KFOs always include KFOs. So uh, Jay knows I feel about including KFOs. So that's important when we talk about a lot when it comes to rural impacts. And, and then I think uh, I was going to make a quick comment about the economic analysis. So is there a way for us to think about uh, um, putting a monetary value to the, uh, the different types of benefits that could be gained, um, health benefits, social benefits, other benefits too. And then this geographic analysis, think about relative and absolute differences in benefits from a snapshot perspective and also over time. So just wanna, just wanna add that in. And as, as, you, as you see how this rule is, it, it's implemented and, the, and, and, and is there an impact? It's just not that, that, that one point in time, change over time too. So just wanted to, just to add that in, thank you. Thank you. Looks like Dr. Olmstead wants to respond there. Just to, to that last question, which is an excellent one, I, I want to clarify that when EPA 
quantifies, monetizes the benefits in this rule. They're just looking at the benefits of changes in uh, the extent of wetlands, right? So avoided loss of wetlands acreage. And those estimates are from stated preference surveys, right? That kind of value different aspects of that loss or lack of loss, um, but are not as broad perhaps, right? As what you uh, are suggesting. In addition, it, it's a sort of a, you know, sort of a single, you know, just this many wetlands are lost, right? And it would be worth, or this many acres of wetlands are lost and it would that, you know, the willingness to pay to avoid that would be X dollars, but there's not as a, you know, kind of a time dimension to the analysis. And so, um, you know, if we were to make those kinds of suggestions, what we would be making suggestions about would be um, pretty fundamental changes to the underlying economic analysis, which then would filter down right into the EJ and the tribal impacts analysis as well. But it's quite a broader point than, um, you know, than just, um, than just thinking about this in the EJ context. Thank you. Taking a moment for other suggestions or changes, questions. Could I just, uh, just Dr. Wilson, I, I didn't catch everything. What your initial group of suggestions were, I think basically with respect to the text that's in the first bullet of, um, of the group's um, responses or recommendations with respect to 4B, the charge question 4B. And I think what we would do is we, we, we could add some things to the list, right, of um, right where uh, the group has said data on CAFOs, pesticide, drift, drinking water, infrastructure and availability, and so on. And I caught septic system use, but didn't didn't write down everything else. I don't know, Dr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with the septic system use, you know, septic systems, if they're, if they're not maintained, uh, can be a source of contamination for um, well water, but then if you think about it can impact wetlands, it impact the whole recharge, that whole that whole cycle, right? And um, and so I just want to share. And then, I, and, I, and then you just remind me to say something for Jay's comments about justice again. I didn't say this. And let me just say this real quickly. So when you think about justice and how it um, is operationalized, recognitional justice, that meaningful involvement, process, community voice, that's recognitional justice, restorative justice procedural justice and distributional justice. So I just want to make sure that those would be the four, if you want to kind of, how EJ kind of places itself out and, and how it can be really broken broken down, those would be the four kind of pillars. So thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. And you, you also could send, uh, you know, text of your set of elements that uh, Dr. Olmstead was just asking about just to make sure we've got, got them all. We're all taking notes, but it's, uh, it's great to have that backup, thanks. Uh, let's see, Dr. Chakraborty and Dr. Ma both put hands up and I don't know what the order was. On this topic, sounds like it might be. You can go ahead, Dr. Ma. Oh, I just, yeah, just a, a quick point about the that first bullet point of the list. I think um, we we discussed, you know, what should be put in into this bullet. And, and I think it's not meant to be an exhaustive list because we didn't want to say these are the things you should have and stop there. Um, and so for that reason, I think we put in the language, for example, these are the things. So, but I, I do think it's good to have that list as a recommendation so they can go, go and explore these different um, different types of um, nuisances that, that contribute to risk. Um, and then one other, I guess, uh, note about the what Dr. Olmstead mentioned about the time dimension. I think, you know, in the benefits, they do discount the, the future benefits, right? And so that if we converted it to a dollar, the distribution, if we added the uh, kind of dollar monetary benefits to uh, the distributional analysis, that would bring in a little bit more of the time component than just looking at like a snapshot in space, here's where exposure is going on. Um, and then I think that's another, like I, I, I think, you know, pot benefit of adding the, the dollar value of the benefits in here is that, you know, ex exposure is not the same thing as welfare, um, and particularly because, you know, different groups have different relationships with this resource. And, and so sometimes that benefits will be able to capture some of that. Thanks, Dr. Ma. Appreciate all of that. Other suggestions or changes, the additional text, anything else? 
I want to commend this team and the whole work group, really such a great um, review and, and really helping us understand all the elements and, and laying it out so clearly. So really appreciate that to all of you. Doesn't look like there's anyone else on this particular topic. So at this point, we would um, we would move to, I, I mean, I again, I, I will circle back as I did last time and just say, I think well, oh, someone has a hand up and it just says iPhone, but it doesn't say who that is. Go ahead. I apologize. This is Lisa Longfight. Thank you. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Um, in light of what has been discussed today, um, I think that instead of uh, taking up airtime here, um, I will make some additional written comments and I can have them to, uh, I'll either mail them out by the end of the day. Um, just some further clarification and um, some more, uh, just some more data sets that that can be um, can be used. Well, well, we welcome you bringing that here, and it's don't don't consider that that's taking time. It shouldn't. This is the time for that. So I'm I'm happy if you want to, you know, step through what those elements are. Very very happy to have that now. So um, part of what we want to look at when you look at Native Americans in the census and getting data that way, that's wildly inaccurate. Unfortunately, um, we have been um, working as tribes, nations, trying to um, come to a point where that's more accurate. That hasn't happened yet. Um, there are other um, resource documents out there. And again, I'll, I'll email them to the group. I apologize. It looks as though I've, I've missed meetings and whatnot. We had a malware hack and it um, really messed up uh, how I'm receiving information and stuff. And so um, I feel like I'm sort of late to the late to the table for things that are so important um, to my work um, and my department and tribes in general. And so, um, but <laughs> I will still add that information and through email, but some of it has to do with more resource document and also um, sources that are being used that might be inaccurate. I think overall, um, I think it's important to have that data there to, to um, include it. But I think overall, I think we know in terms of um, this subject, uh, we're moving in a certain direction. I think that that the science I think is um, accurate in terms of um, land use, land change, all of that. So that's just a really quick comment and I appreciate your, your time and patience. Oh, I appreciate you bringing this. And I think to the extent we can point to other data sources, that's a tremendous function and, and really appreciate that you can bring some of that. Uh, and, and if others have that as well. And we've heard throughout the comments here, you know, folks flagging things to, to know about and that we can raise. So very much um, appropriate and, and, and welcomed. So thank you. Um, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, just one more thing. Um, yeah. And when we talk about cultural things, and I, and I think that um, we all sort of know this, um, one size does not fit all. Um, there's many different ways in which we look at water. And it's, um, it's accurate to say that it is um, ceremonial and sacred. That, that's true. There's other things that, um, the ways in which we, uh, when we talk about water usage. And so, um, and that's, that's important. And so what we do is when we look at our data, it's not, um, I think it's not properly, but it's, it's, um, it's for reason. It's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's almost hidden data, but there are other ways that we, what we're doing now is we're trying to say, okay, we need to provide this data because without this data, we're not a part of the conversation in the most accurate way that we can be. And so there's some of the things that we're doing now um, as working groups and whatnot, trying to um, get the data to the um, federal agencies and, and other partners so they can use it, so the data can be used and it can be acknowledged without having to give up information that would be culturally inappropriate or um, it would just, it wouldn't be good for us in terms of, of our cultures and in different areas. And that is, that's sort of a general statement, but that's an accurate sort of broad statement for all of that. And we also want to make sure that our our data is properly disaggregated from the state and federal data. That's very important as well. And so again, thank you. Thank you very much. 
Yeah, thanks. Those issues of aggregation and disaggregation, super important. Um, and the sort of multiple values of water, um, being able to open up that as we talk about this. So please do um, send you know whatever comments you can about additional language. And if you need assistance getting the documents again, please do reach out to Tom Armitage because I'm sure we can try to double up on that. Um, you know, in the past we were always mailing all these huge documents to everyone, and now it's all email, which on the one hand kind of is immediate. On the other hand, there are a lot of technical issues. So so please don't uh, don't hesitate to ask for backup on that. Uh, Dr. Thorne. So that just revealed to me something and the discussion that we had earlier about whether or not tribal was included in minority was really thought of in the context of a statistical issue. But I think what, what, what we've just heard is that, that there's another dimension to that inclusion where it, it's culturally inappropriate. And maybe that that's something that um, needs to be pointed out as well. And that's a, that's a change to the wording that can be um, incorporated. I, it's, I sense that there's more there too. So I am looking forward to seeing the, the written comments as well. Thanks for flagging that. Other thoughts? This is very much the time to bring all kinds of issues. All right, well, let's turn then to uh, the letter to the EPA administrator. And this is something you received in the materials for the meeting with all the attachments. Uh, let's see, so I'm just pulling that up. So the intended audience for the, the letter that SAP would send is the EPA administrator and other high level agency officials. And the letter should really highlight the key points in the report. Of course, the report goes as well. So I was thinking of stepping through the bullets, see if there are any changes or additions needed based on the conversation that we just had or other things that folks have flagged along the way. And I'll just go through those bullets. Um, the first part of the letter is kind of boilerplate about the process and so forth. So uh, the first me, bullet- would you, mind, would you mind just giving us the title of that file? I'm having some trouble finding it. Maybe it's just named in a way that I'm not- um, Yeah, no, so it's, it's, Tom Armitage, could you say what it was called? Yeah. I pulled it down with it's, all my whole actually, set of materials. It, it's in it, the report. It's, the, it's, the oh, that's report. why it's separate, okay. The first, oh, it's, the in, first, it's in the report itself, thank you. The first page is the letter. First thank you. I, I disaggregated all my materials, so thank you. <laughs> all right, uh, so the first bullet, uh, the SAB commends the EPA for its previous work to develop the document titled Connectivity of Streams and Wetlands to Downstream Waters, a review and synthesis of the scientific evidence, uh, Perens Connectivity Report, and its recent work to develop the technical support document for the proposed revised definition of waters of the US rule. Based on the principles of hydrology and the review of the science discussed in these documents, there is more than speculative or insubstantial evidence for the effects of shallow subsurface hydrologic connections on the chemical, physical, or biological integrity of connected waters. So I did think it was worth reading the whole thing. So based on conversation that we had uh, two days ago or today, is there anything we should be changing about that language? I'll move to the next one then, not seeing any hands. Uh, second bullet, the findings and conclusions in sections two C and D of the technical support document are supported by the available scientific literature. The review of the published literature is thorough and in general is technically accurate. Papers published since the 2015 connectivity report overwhelmingly support the report's conclusions and in some cases strengthen the conclusions. And we did hear about that on Tuesday. Any suggestions or thoughts, any wording that needs to be changed reflecting that conversation? All right, I'll move to the third bullet. 
Uh, the SAB finds that a switch from state-based to radius-based benefit estimates as piloted in Appendix H of the economic analysis could potentially improve the agency's economic analysis, but some caveats should be taken into consideration. Reflecting again that conversation that we had and the work that the work group did. Anything there that needs another look or a change? I wonder if there might be the opportunity to hint at what those caveats might be. Um, it's, a, it's such an open-ended comment, um, even in just a phrase or an additional sentence as to what they relate to. Yeah, and so the, the whole report has a lot of detail, but I think you're saying a little bit more detail here to just point to those places. Um, That's all. Yeah, yeah sure like this. Well, it was yeah. a little underdeveloped compared yeah. to the others. Yep, I think we can pull that. Do uh, Tom Armitage, do we need to hammer down exact language there or can we just take that uh, as a suggestion and, and put a little more detail here? Where, where do we need to fall on I that think line? It, it, I think if, uh, if everyone is, is agreeable to having you uh, decide what we point to and what we put in there, then we could do it that way and not have to work out the exact language. Uh, but I think it would be, if someone objected to that, I guess we could talk, to talk more about okay. it. Okay. No, it sounds like it's um, it's not something new. It's pulling uh, from the work group report also into this location as well. So I think that that falls under the, um, Dr. Olmsted and I can can probably together try to work that out. Yeah, that's and, just summarizing kind of these bullets that cross from page 10 to 11, um, just specifically with respect to the radius based estimates. So I think we should be able to do that. Yeah, sure thing. And Dr. Borsak, if you had something specific that you wanted to see from that um, a report, you know, do do send a text. Uh, okay. Do send the text. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Moving to the next bullet, then, if I don't see any other hands, the agency's approach to environmental federalism in the economic analysis for the proposed rule is not consistent with best practices in benefit cost analysis, and it should be dropped. The agencies should include all states' benefits and costs in the economic analysis. This will require adding the omitted states' benefits and costs into all aspects of the analysis, for example, estimating them in the meta-analysis. This will also make the economic analysis consistent with the environmental justice and tribal impacts analyses, which appear to include all states. Let me pause and see if there's anything additional we should be doing there. So I just found it a, a um, sort of a broad sweeping statement that was fairly vague. You just drop it all. Um, is if is that literally the intent, um, or is there something more specific that needs to be put into that? It is broad. So you know, again, the the approach was that the agencies have you know sort of tables in the appendices where they estimate benefits at, and costs at the state level for all the states. But in the main analysis, in you know the kind of what's reported in the economic analysis itself, um, they leave out you know twenty three states or something like that on the basis of what the agencies predict that states will do in response to the change in federal jurisdiction. Um, and so what we're recommending is don't do that, right? Don't drop those 23 states, just use the estimates for all states. So that's why it's broad in the sense of kind of, they've done the, the work, right? In terms of creating the tables, but now we're asking them to include all those states estimates, just the way they're included in the EJ and the tribal impacts analyses. I guess maybe I'm misunderstanding, but it seems to me that, okay, their approach their entire approach, uh, bits and pieces, or, I mean, what you just said is far more specific. Don't drop 23 states. Don't assume you know what states are doing. Right. Uh, yeah, and, that is, I mean, that is the approach to federalism. We can we can change that language, but that that is exactly, right, that is the only approach in the analysis to federalism in this current, uh, there okay. were other approaches in the new bird, but this one is just, this, just that. Okay. I appreciate this comment. And I think this is another one where um, the letter to the administrator is trying to just hit that high level, but not so high that we don't know what we're saying. And then, uh, you know, referring to the work group report more fully. So there, you know, in terms of the details there, it looks like uh, I will call on Lisa Lundfeit. Hi, okay. So um, again, uh, the states cannot be the default AOI. So 
when the states, let's say, are in what you just read, the AOI, AOI then um, tribes must be on an equal basis of the AOI. And we sort of talked about this before, where you were saying um, federal tribal state or federal state and tribal, that sort of thing, because that then that does make the it um, the data inaccurate in that way. And then we have three sovereigns, federal, state, and tribes. Right, and we were going to make those changes to the work group report. So let's see, what should we do here to make sure we make the same uh, kind of a change then it looks like to the yeah. wording. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there, I mean, so here, um, the only thing I would note is the way that the agencies have done this is estimate benefits and costs just by 50 states. And so we would be, if I think, um, what's being suggested is that they should, in addition, I mean, then again, that's quite different. It's not something that we, we had in the report, but we, in addition, they should break out um, impacts to tribal nations one by one. Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, um, this is Lisa. So uh, <laughs> this is... Uh, I think complex, but I think it is something that um, certainly um, needs to be a part of this. And I'm not exactly sure how we're going to be able to um, to to do this. Other than, I guess, I just my my statement is that um, we can't continue to privilege the states um, over the tribes, and that's that's right now what it is. And um, so it would have to be state by state. However, we do have that that um, data in, in other resources and I can maybe pull an example for um, maybe certainly for North Dakota, but maybe for a couple of other um, neighboring states, maybe Montana, South Dakota to sort of show the data, um, maybe the data hub that they have that would maybe pull that out of that. So we could put a line here that says, you know, in order to, um, to bring this into alignment, really, I mean, with an equal footing for tribes. Um, I think know, that's and, and excellent. Uh, excellent. One of the things I'll just note to give an example. Um, so when you look at the Standing Rock Reservation, which is not my reservation, but it is in North Dakota. And so when you look at that reservation, that reservation is spans um, North, I mean, it has, uh, the reservation is located in North Dakota and South Dakota. So if you're pulling that data out, then that would be, uh, there would be some inaccuracies. Um, I think that's pretty clear to see there would be a lot of inaccuracy there. Okay, I'm jotting as much of this down as I can. I think it will be helpful to see, um, you know, your language suggestion too, just to make sure we um, cover it. And I think this is, you know, it's not just about this action where I think this is also, you know, moving forward and broader and for uh, actions into the future, we want we want to continue um, to be able to make these points. So it's it's certainly something we want to say here, but I think we also, um, you know, we're pointing out, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so um, yeah, this is definitely a meta issue. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, understood. Sorry, someone else was just trying to hop in there. Go ahead. Or it might have been a mute button issue. If if you are trying to get back in, just see if you can flag me with your hand, and I'll I'll call you for sure. It, while somebody else is jumping in, Dr. Cullen, I would just note if we make this change here, we should also make a note to change it in the um, in the body of the report too. Yes, and I think we we had flagged that we were going to try to make a statement in the main body of the report um, from that conversation on Tuesday, and I think this is. We'll, we'll just try to make sure we reflect in both places because this is supposed to pull from that and also highlight certain things. And this is a good um, time to highlight, right? We want to make sure we not just hit this in the in the report itself, but also here. So yes, I agree. that's correct. I agree. All right. Looking quickly, see if there's any other hand. Okay. Next bullet, I believe I'm in the right place. EPA's economic analysis still undervalues parens omits. Significant categories of benefits, the SAB recommends that the economic analysis discuss and consider incorporating additional wetland benefits, such as the significant values associated with flood protection from the recent economics literature. The SAB finds that future efforts to estimate and include the wide range of omitted benefits would be extremely valuable. 
So this is a pretty specific one and refers back again to the workgroup report. Anyone see something here that needs another look or an additional phrase or word or editing? Dr. Thorne. Yeah, does this undervalue part refer to also um, the, the uh, different radius determinations like where nothing over 200 miles was considered? Hmm, let's see, or I think I'll turn somewhere else. Yeah, I'll turn to the work group to see. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think that we would include that um, in the third bullet, right? So when, where we'll make sort of a brief list of the recommendations um, with respect just to the radius-based approach. And here we're talking more about, um, members I noted earlier, right? What EPA has done is um, just use this kind of meta-analysis of the state of preference literature um, on the you know, benefits of avoided wetlands loss, kind of acreage loss. Um, and that includes many things, but not things like, you know, flood control. And right? so it's more kind of adding items to the list of what could be valued than it is taking a different approach to using kind of the values that are already out there. So I think I would leave those as two separate things, if that's all right with folks. But, um, but we could also, you know, I think what we talked about in uh, Tuesday's discussion was maybe being a little more specific about not just flood protection, right, but some other ecosystem services. I think Dr. Irwin was going to send some language to um, about that. And so that would expand, you know, this list a little bit um, as well. We could do that in the body of the report, but also in the bullet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Just checking around quickly, seeing if anyone else wants to weigh in on that. Looks like we're set. Okay, so... Uh, for the next bullet, the explanation in the economic analysis for why the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers permit cost estimates are more appropriate than the Sunding and Silberman estimates is reasonable, and the choice appears to be justified. However, additional analyses are recommended to support this approach. And again, this refers then back to material that's presented in the, the fuller report. And this is just highlighting that point here. Anything we should be adding or emphasizing differently. Seems like that one is pretty, pretty clear then. Okay. Uh, let's see next. The text in the preamble of the rule and the technical support document addressing climate change is generally accurate. However, it oversimplifies issues of non-stationarity associated with climate change and incorrectly states that storm surges and hurricanes are becoming more frequent. Some suggested changes are recommended to more accurately reflect the science. And we heard about those today. Uh, Dr. Guckenheimer. Mute myself. There you go. Let <laughs> me um, come back to, to my point about um, water resources. And uh, again, a general question where, where I'm far from uh, being knowledgeable is the extent to which aquifers are viewed as a resource that falls within the, the Clean Water Act. It seems to me that there's very, very little discussion of replenishment or depletion of, of aquifers in any of this material on WOTUS, uh, but it clearly is an issue that is part of the integrity of the nation's waters. And so I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, in this particular bullet and in the, the longer report, that calling attention to uh, increased uncertainty about the integrity of the nation's water supply due to climate change is something that, that we might emphasize a bit more. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, and there's a lot of complexity about what is and is not um, obviously covered. Uh, Dr. Rodewald, did you want to respond to that? Um, sure, yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really good point. And although like the drinking water is, you know, covered of course under another law, 
I don't see why it would be a problem to just highlight that this, the choices that are made in terms of of the Clean Water Act also have consequences for, yeah, groundwater recharge, aquifers, drinking water supplies. I mean, that, you know, we're not, we wouldn't be saying that that needs to be part of the decision structure, you know, here, but we're just recognizing that. Thank yeah, I think we'd be reflecting the scientific basis for that connectivity and um, that water system, basically. So we right. could, yeah, we could put another uh, sentence here. Dr. Beck, did you want to add to that point or are you on a different point? I am a different point. Okay, hang on just a second. So I think we could just sort of add a, a sentence here. And Dr. Guckenheimer, if you had something specific in terms of text, you could send that. Um, we can also just sort of flag and and think about it uh, with the work group, myself, Tom Armitage. Okay. It's a good point. I think as long as we are talking about the scientific basis yeah. of water being connected and what that means and what the implications are, then I think we're in our, yeah. you know, I mean, we're it, in it, our charge. It, it seems to me that, that um, connection through aquifers is almost a second order kind of connection between um, waters that has distinct aspects from what we think of as subsurface flow. Okay, I'm just jotting quickly here. But I think it I'm not be. sure. Oh, I was just gonna say I'm not sure that it, it seems like the connection, the connectivity that was the focus of the charge question again is specifically shallow subsurface water connections. So right. not so much connections via the aquifer. But I think, again, if we talk about that, there are implications of, you know, those decisions to, to those other connections, that, that would seem, that seems fair. Agreed. I'm guessing if not, we'll hear about that in the next review. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, let's see, Dr. Beck. Um, mine point is really uh, additional clarification to the second sentence where we say uh, it oversimplifies issues of non-stationarity associated with climate change incorrectly states that storm surges and hurricanes are becoming more frequent. Um, I think it would be important to say after more frequent rather than more intense because the more intense storms are becoming more frequent. So I think that would be a clarification because it could be um, misinterpreted as it's presently stated. Tell me one more time you wanted to say after uh, incorrectly after, states that storm surges and hurricanes are becoming more frequent. You had another phrase. Go ahead. Uh, rather than more intense. Rather than more intense. Thank you. Or we might say, if I could just make a, a, an additional suggestion, it, it, it incorrectly suggests that all surges and hurricanes are becoming more frequent rather than, yes, the, the, the most That's intense. helpful. Yes, no, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. All right. Quick scan of the room. I think we're, I think we're ready for the next bullet. Uh, so the EPA supports the agency's proposal to allow use of methods other than the traditional rolling 30 year average that are designed to better capture normal quotes precipitation in a time of rapidly changing climate. And we heard about that one today and there's obviously the, the detail on that one is in the work groups report. Anything additional we want to say at this high level for the letter. Okay, then moving to the next bullet, uh, the discussion of environmental justice in the technical support document is generally technically sound. However, re recommendations are provided to clarify and improve the discussion. We heard about that today as well. And um, quite a few recommendations were made to improve, uh, to improve that part. So that is a, a very modest statement in the letter compared to uh, the amount that's in the report, I think.
Dr. Elian. Um, yeah, just to reiterate what you said, the last two bullets are both very general and a little bit written differently than the, all the previous bullets in terms of response. And I'm so I'm not unfortunately suggesting anything specific to add to that, but I think it's worth considering that the the EJ piece may deserve a little bit more input in this letter that is going to be read potentially more than you know the the document that follows. Yeah, so I'm, so pulling, I'm not helping at all. <laughs> no, you are, and having a little more of the specific content pulled into this letter, um, you know, trying to walk that line of of not putting so much here that. That things get lost, but being able to flag more of that, it looks like Dr. Sharkaporty might have a suggestion there too. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking uh, because if you break it down by the two charge questions four and four four B, uh, if the first bullet is about four A, then the, the question was about technical accuracy. So maybe we can say that there are certain technical accuracies and limitations, you know, that should be addressed without listing all nine of them, you know, uh, in the in the same paragraph or sentence. So. That would be my suggestion. That sounds like a great idea. And if you would also send that, you know, refer to the particular bulletin and a version of, of the text uh, in terms of what you just said, that would be great if you could send that to Tom Armitage. I would thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Thorne. Yeah, just wanted to bring up um, the notion that when the agency responds, generally they respond to the letter. And, and so if the letter lacks these additional details, then so will the response from the agency. Um, so I think it, it, it's a good idea to um, add a little bit more specificity, even at the risk of making the letter, um, quote unquote, too long. Thanks, yeah, agreed. Uh, let's see, Dr. Neptune and then uh, Dr. Emanuel. Hi, uh, yeah, um, I, I also wanted to kind of emphasize the fact that those comments um, that Jay kind of presented so beautifully, I think it would benefit from a greater degree of granularity, especially I think because of that issue of disaggregation was something that kept coming up in the discussion. And, and that certainly should be a point of focus when they kind of read this letter. So um, I think that making it much more elemental and um, to emphasize that the kind of the view of this concept of environmental justice is, is not simply superficial. There are very important points of kind of emphasis that need to be developed. The, the, the other aspect of it is I, I think Dr. Wilson's kind of breakdown of the elements of, of environmental justice that need to be integrated in documents going forward I, I think it might be nice to include those here so people can start thinking about how to construct an understanding of some of these concepts going forward. Thanks, I think that's really helpful. And if you have specific ones, I understand you were referring to Dr. Wilson's suggestion as well, which is great. But if you have other specific ones, you know, certainly do, do send them. Um, I will. Just, you know, in terms of what to really highlight at each level of the communication we're trying to do, because we're trying to obviously communicate at multiple channels. So, yeah, I really appreciate the comment about how to I, do that effectively. Because I would worry that 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 bullet point will be read as environmental justice, you know, I heart or you know, whatever. And we right, with nothing specific. Yeah, no, exactly. obviously that's that would be a shame and, and that would be a real miss. So, yeah, appreciate it. it and again, if you have. We, we have quite a bit of, of content that's come up in this discussion, which has been great. So just, you know, any suggestions you have about um, your sort of top priorities, your, your next set and so forth. I know it's hard to pick and choose, but thanks. Yeah, Dr. Emanuel and then Dr. Uzichaku. Thanks. I want to echo the, the desire to elevate the, the non-distributional aspects of environmental justice into uh, those last two bullet points. And I would also suggest that we um, elevate language about adding statistical rigor um, to the analyses themselves and, and uh, make that part of the letter as well for the exact same uh, reasons that Dr. Neptune described, uh, not, not um, giving short shrift 
to environmental justice and, and the science that underpins it. That's great. So the second one was a statistical rigor and the first one, just say it again so I make sure I have it in my notes. The, the non-distributional oh, non aspect yeah, thank you. of EJ. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Ozi Chuck. Yes, uh, this letter is designed for non-scientists. Is that right? Well, it goes to the administrator and it's read by high level officials and some of them are scientists and some of them, you know, less, less so, but uh, I don't, is that a, an okay answer? Is it more tilted towards political? Uh, I mean, we're, we're not political per se. We're definitely um, trying to address always the scientific and technical underpinnings of things. So in some sense, we are always talking about, about science. Uh, conversations about science do enter the political sphere, but we are not um, directly trying to have a political conversation. Yes, I know that, but in the Sorry. end, it's gonna get into the hands of some political groups and they may start spinning it their own way. So which means that the language is important. Language is very important, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Is there a good, um, a good approach for us to sharpen some of this up and, and not uh, regret later that it's been possible to take it away we didn't intend? I'm happy to, happy for any additional comments about that. I think that is, that expresses, you know, the, the heart of what we're trying to do. So, yes. Uh, let's see, Dr. Rossi and Dr. Alien. Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess I wanted to, uh, I agree with all this discussion. It's super important to have um, some specifics in here. Can I, can I ask um, Dr. Emanuel, if maybe we could change the, the language. Um, uh, I think you said the non-distributional aspects of environmental justice. Maybe we could put that in a more, in a, in a slightly different way and say the aspects of environmental justice that go beyond distribution, right? Because it's, um, it's, it's a slightly different way of wording kind of the same thing, but I think it's important to state that it's more than just distribution that are the issues of environmental justice that should be considered. And so it's a, it's a little bit more active way of saying that. It's just a suggestion, and, and I'm not an expert in this area, so I, I appreciate um, if Dr. Emanuel can make a comment or someone else. Um, it, it's a slightly different way of saying it. I, I think you're absolutely right. So in the, in the interest of not having the text of this letter taken the wrong way, um, it, I, I totally agree with framing that in a way that says you, you need to address these things in addition to the distributional aspects of environmental justice. And all of these are, are critically important for EPA to consider. Thank you both, that very helpful point. Uh, Dr. Elion and then Dr. Shocker Borden. Um, yeah, I just feel, again, I really appreciate the comments about adding more specificity into the EJ points. And I feel one area that is important up front here is maybe, and I'm not an expert again, as um, others have said for other areas, just about the tribal issues that have been brought forward. And I know that there's gonna be changes in the document that will be more reflective of that, but I um, would encourage that also being up somewhere. It doesn't have to be long at all, but just as a sentence and recognized in this two page upfront document. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah, and, and we definitely want to bring the letter into alignment with some of the changes that will be made. And we had that really great discussion on Tuesday and, and a little bit more today as well. So yeah, that's certainly the intention. Thanks. Dr. Sharker Bordy. Yeah, just in light of the discussion we've had, I mean, I've thought about several ways in which we can expand on the first of the two bullets. That, I mean, again, making it consistent with question 4A. So I was thinking of, you know, saying that the discussion of EJ in the technical support document is generally sound, but more rigorous quantitative analysis may be necessary and some of the analytical assumptions could be better justified as the first sentence and then say several recommendations are provided to clarify and improve the discussion and address uh, some of the technical inaccuracies and limitations. Is that... Uh, satisfactory or do we want to provide examples as well in a third sentence I guess is my question for the group that's a terrific addition if there would be an example or two I think that that would you know 
that, that would be great as well. So certainly not an either or. I think what you just said, if you also captured that and you can send it, and I took notes on it too, but um, yeah, I think an, an example or two would be terrific. Yeah, thanks. It just makes it easier for the audience who's reading it to say, okay, and this is actionable now for us. What do we do to try to you know, respond and to do more in these areas? And that's really a, the shared goal, I think, of, um, of ourselves and also the audience who will read this. So really appreciate that. Let's see, Dr. Bond and then Dr. Guggenheimer. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm gonna call for help from my colleagues who are more experienced and sophisticated than I am. But I believe that I, I picked up a hint during prior discussion today that, um, that some new data approaches may be needed, but also that possibly trying to quantify things or placing data on, on um, or placing, subjecting everything to analysis may not be culturally appropriate um, and may not bring out some cultural aspects that are important. And so um, while I support the discussion about approaching things um, with different analyses, which means to break down, right? Um, I, I'm curious whether there is a need to develop language that also recognizes different ways of calling out um, the cultural aspects of, of water and, and so on without requiring analysis. Um, and so I'm, I'm really seeking help more than anything else, but I feel like I, I heard that come out a little bit and I, and I don't see how we're reflecting that in our language. Thanks. And I will call uh, Lisa Lonefight. I also, um, my internet in the middle froze for a second. I think I captured a lot of what you said, but I'm, I'm listening hard now because I know I may have missed something in the middle. Uh, Lisa Lonefight, why don't you go and then it'll be Dr. Guggenheimer and uh, Dr. Olmsted because I think you're following up on this point. point. Uh, yes, I am. So um, we talk, uh, so when we, just speaking to what, um, the previous um, speaker said, so we have issues of intellectual property theft um, that complicate things. And so that's why some of this um, data that we, we share has to be considered differently. And, but we have ways, um, I, I'm, I belong to a, an international working group and um, we had these same questions. Um, these had to do with the, had, had to do with the water. And, um, so we found a way to word this, word things in a way that it could be, um, that it was understood by everybody. And the reason why the wording was so important is um, we had people who were, I'm a geospatial scientist. And so we had people who came from sort of the indigenous science background, but also the, um, let's say Western science background and trying to work with uh, people who were from mainly um, a, Western science type background. And we came up with some wording that um, where there was some protection there um, and some understanding and basically um, left it in the, um, the hands of the indigenous populations that um, would, um, it gave them that room or that protection in terms of that. Though. So I, I do think the wording is important, um, but it's more of not to be more general and allow those um, different native nations to be able to speak to um, those issues of science in in their um, their homelands. Thanks. Um, I think it would be wonderful to hear the the language that you all came up with and and ways to leave space and really um, you know protect. Certainly, we don't want to harm. Um, so I appreciate that comment. Now, I know I have several people who might be following up on this particular conversation, and then I know there are other threads as well. So maybe first, uh, is there someone with a hand up that's following this conversation? Uh, Dr. Olmsted? Oh, you are. Dr. Goodman, go ahead. Thank you. With, with, with regard to examples and also with the, the last comment, I think elevating uh, into the letter uh, a comment that the use of um, census tracts for doing statistical analysis of um, 
does not align well with the different populations uh, with regard to environmental justice issues. Thanks. That's something that's come up a number of times and, and it seems to me it, it's sort of one of the, the fundamental things in, in trying to do the disaggregation of the data that, that we're asking for. Yeah, I appreciate that comment. Um, and also understanding better if and when data are shared, how to make sure that those protections are built in. So yeah, appreciate that comment. Uh, then I'll go in order, Dr. Olmsted and then Dr. Emanuel. This is such an important conversation and a set of really interesting points. It does link back to one of the distinctions that we talked about making in the bullet with respect to the federalism analysis. So I think taken literally, what, what I took away from that initial discussion was that the agency should, in addition to calculating benefits and costs by state, should also do so for each tribal nation. But it strikes me, given our discussion about, you know, kind of cultural and spiritual values, that that might not be a welcome approach, right, in some communities. And so, right, monetizing, right, sort of, as, you know, and right, and in addition, we have a a challenge that uh, Lisa Lonefight has identified and even thinking about like what would be the boundaries of right each of those communities. And so it almost feels like we need a, you know, a sentence there that says something like going forward, right? So there's, there's the tribal impacts analysis, right? Which has a lot of room for discussion of some of these sensitive issues. And then there's the benefit cost analysis, but maybe we need to have, you know, kind of a discussion even there that says, when we do this by state, right, we're sort of ignoring the fact that there are, you know, sovereign nations um, that are within states that cross state boundaries and so on. And that, um, you know, that at that level, which is also important, we, you know, you know, calculating estimating benefits and costs in the way that we're doing here may or may not be appropriate, right, depending on the community and depending on the resource and so on. So it feels like we might need to add that kind of language rather than just say, right, well, you know, let's just kind of put, you know, tribal nations and states on the same footing in the benefit cost analysis and just run this thing, right, the way, uh, the way we do across state borders. So, but I'm curious about feedback on that so that we can make sure that we get the language right. Yeah, I appreciate that point too. We, we've heard um, that we need both of these things in a sense. We do want to, to appreciate and acknowledge sovereignty and then that we also, um, that our tools are not capturing fully, uh, you know, what is going on in this analysis. So I, I appreciate both parts of that. Dr. Emanuel, and then I'll, I'll watch for other people who wanna follow on that point. So this comment relates to the current discussion, but it, it can also be filed under um, science communication and, and, and outreach. Um, I, I think that one way to hold uh, people accountable in a letter like this is to remind them of things that they have said themselves. And there's this, wonderful example in one of the appendices or supplemental documents that we were provided um, where the tribal perspective, tribal nations individually um, have their um, regulatory frameworks enumerated um, one by one um, in, in this document. And that, that point is buried um, deep in one of the recommendations um, of, of the letter. But I think it, it may be helpful to elevate that um, to the to the top of this letter and remind EPA that you've already gone to the trouble of inventorying uh, for, for many different tribal nations, their specific regulatory perspectives um, on water that engage with the Clean Water Act. Um, and, and that could be the basis for either further engagement or some further consideration that respects their sovereignty as um, tribal nations. And I don't know if this is within our purview or not, but we could also remind EPA about um, tribal consultation mandates under, for example, Executive Order 13175. Um, and this might be a this might be an opportunity for EPA to go back and, and hold additional consultations with tribal nations as they're as they're preparing um, whatever this analysis or non-analysis is going to look like. 
Yeah, I think as, as long as um, we're reflecting that it's, you know, best practice and in order to do sound science and, and actually have a, an approach that's, that's sound, you know, certainly, we, you know, they should be following those, those practices. I, um, I, you know, it's hard because I would love to go further, but I, yeah, I think, I think this will be a great place though for us to really, I, I like your point about reminding them about what they said and what they're doing um, and, and supporting that too. I mean, it's not just reminding, it's trying to support those efforts and say, here's, here's additional work that you could be, additional benefit you could be getting from that. Dr. Guckenheim, you've got your hand up. Uh, so one more comment on, on this is that this discussion uh, reminds me very much of the discussion that, that, that we had <clears throat> at our board meeting in, in March about uh, cumulative impacts. That the desire of uh, EPA in order to take a holistic approach and look at uh, quality of life is something that we're really talking about here in the, the way in which we're saying that it's not just money, that the, the impacts are, are significantly broader than that. And we need to, to rec recognize other things. And it might be worthwhile to add um, a reference to that in the main body of the report, if not the letter. So th this would be with uh, respect to adding, in addition to sort of health, there's well-being. there's, um, you just used another word, uh, quality of life. Quality of life, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Dr. Wilson. Oh, yes, to add to that last comment, um, hopefully it's relevant. Exposure Science, the 21st Century Report, written about 10 years ago. We talked about positive exposures. All this for reference, again, I may have said before, salutogenic exposures. Is a, that's a frame that we've been pushing a lot, at least I've been pushing a lot, to, to not just about negative exposures, but talk about positive exposures. And so it talks about well-being, quality of life, uh, you know, across all dimensions of the environment. So that's that's a, that's a, um, a, a Antonovsky's frame that could be useful in the con con context of exposome, positive exposures that are part of the exposome. So thank you. Thanks. And I think that is the conversation Dr. Guckenheimer was referring to that we had at that March meeting, because I knew you brought that up then. So thanks. Cool. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for bringing it back around. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome. All right. I'm, I'm realizing that I didn't read the final bullet, although we've partly uh, dug into it a little bit. So why don't I read the final bullet? And then uh, if we want to have any additional conversation, we can make a space for that. And then we'll see where we where we are. And I don't know if we'll need a break or not. We'll just sort of see how it how it goes. So um, again, the agency's plan to broaden the scope of distributive EJ and tribal analysis is, sorry, I need to say this differently. The agency's plans to broaden the scope of distributive EJ and tribal analysis are appropriate and promising recommendations are provided to further develop the EPA's plans for environmental justice analysis. And although I hadn't read this bullet before, some of the comments actually also, I think, pertain to this one. I have hands from Dr. Emanuel and Dr. Shakabordi. Um, may I suggest that we uh, keep the word, uh, I think promising is in there, I, I lost it from my screen, but, but remove the word appropriate, because those plans that were provided to us are, are very brief, and I don't, I, I don't know about the, I'd like to hear what the others think, but I don't feel comfortable calling them appropriate given the cursory nature um, of what was provided. I agree completely with that statement. I support that. I don't know whether whether we should add something else to the statement, but I, I completely agree with that statement. So the suggestion is to take out appropriate and to say promising and, and given the, the small amount that's there, I mean, I suppose maybe this was intended to say that the small amount that was there was, was appropriate, but not, you know, it wasn't an appropriate amount. It was, you know, not, uh, it, it, it was, it, as far as it went, it was okay, but I think you're right. If we want to just reflect on promising and not say appropriate, because otherwise it may it could go either way. It's an ambiguous statement, Dr. Shackelford. No, say promising, but 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 brief or but <laughs> to I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
Dr. Sharkerbordy, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with that, but uh, I was thinking that the second sentence can be uh, revised as uh, recommendations are provided to further develop this plan plans and extend the analysis beyond distributive EJ to include procedural and participatory EJ issues or something like that to address you know the other comments you had. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And um, again, specific language like that, do do send it. I will, yeah. Once yeah. Highlights. yeah, I realized I hadn't read this final bullet because we were having the discussion about the previous one, but certainly things we were saying before were relevant here too. So yeah, thanks. I just really wanna appreciate this discussion. I think people are, are really digging in and I, I do, um, I have a lot of gratitude for that. Dr. Weintraub. Thank you, good morning. Yeah, I have, been really appreciating listening to this very rich and thank you for your facilitation. Um, my only sort of question slash comment here is I think the theme that I keep hearing is that we're making um, suggestions and we need to come back to um, Dr. Cullen with, with concrete examples of what we actually would like. So in this particular case, I think we are saying that what was done and included was correct technically, which is really what we've been asked, but inadequate in that we believe there are uh, that in order to be complete in its technical accuracy, um, there are other considerations or approaches or um, strategies to evaluate that we think need to be brought in and then um, be explicit about what they are. And this isn't my area of expertise really. So I do really appreciate everybody um, bringing in their you know, specific comments that help even you know people like me who are supposedly a, you know, technically savvy audience um, to be able to understand exactly what it is we're talking about and suggesting. And it'll help, I think, EPA um, return with, uh, with res appropriately responsive, appropriately and adequately responsive, um, you know, revisions. Thanks. And that word adequate was the one I was grasping for before. So thank you. Dr. Thorne, go ahead. Yeah, at the risk of being the persnickety grammarian, I noted in the fourth bullet, we have agencies as possessive plural, which I think we mean EPA and the Army Corps. But then further down, we sometimes use, well, we have agencies in the singular plural, or singular possessive. And then we have the agencies plan, but then in the possessive plural, but then we're referring just to the EPA in the last bullet. So we might want to just check those things, make sure. Yeah, thanks. No, persnickety is fine. And yeah, we, we will take a run through on those as well. Yeah. And, and it's ironic that me as an engineer brings this forward. I'm not sure I find that ironic, <laughs> but thank you for bringing it forward. And, I, and I'd like to blame my, uh, I had to read the sentence twice, but um, that wasn't why it was just bad reading. So yeah, thanks. We, we can fix that. It's easily fixed. All right, we have a lot of great suggestions and material here. I'm just looking around, seeing if there's anything else that we should capture while we're all together. I don't see any hands. And so uh, what I was going to do is, um, I'd like us to make a decision about final approval of the draft WOTUS report. And so I would call for a motion to approve the report with the changes we've agreed upon. Um, before we do that, I would like to hear requests to speak. So I think I'll turn to Tom and find out what we have. Have we received any requests to speak? Uh, yes, I'm just let me look for my email. I'm sorry. I want to that's double check. Right. Yeah, that's quite right. Uh, no, I have not received any requests for additional public comments. Okay, thank you. 
So, um, oh, Dr. Thorne, go ahead. So realizing that there's uh, a number of different uh, paths forward, I would like to mo move that, um, that the that you and, and the work group chair, uh, Dr. Olmsted, uh, incorporate all these recommended changes to the letter and to the body of the report and put it forward. Thanks. So we have a motion to put this report forward and I will not change that motion, but I'll, I'll just reflect that. I think Dr. Olmsted and I will also be looking for like, what are the sort of overarching issues that we in addition want to start, I think we need to start accumulating and really tracking very specifically some, some things that are going to be cross-cutting across lots of actions. Um, but again, not changing your motion in any way. I just reflecting that we're, you know, we're hearing you. So is there a second for the motion to approve the draft report with the changes that have been requested? Second. Thank you. Uh, we can move to a vote unless there is any further discussion. Acknowledging that we had a very robust discussion, I will move to a vote on the motion. Um, and let's try the, the group voice vote. So if you unmute, all in favor of the motion, which is to approve the port report with the recommended changes that will be dealt with by Dr. Olmsted and myself, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you. So the motion carries. So we will incorporate those changes and um, send the final report to members for concurrence and then it will be uh, transmitted to the administrator. All right, well, thanks. That was a, a very robust conversation. Uh, I wanna really thank the members of the Chartered SAB for participating in a super productive meeting. And uh, let me just review some follow-up items and next steps. So uh, we will take follow-up steps. This is going all the way back to Tuesday as well, if we can think back that far. We'll take follow-up steps to implement the board's decision to advise EPA on the planned regulatory actions that we discussed um, at our whole two-day meeting. Board has decided to review the science supporting two proposed rules. The first is standards of performance for new reconstructed and modified sources and emissions guidelines for existing sources, oil and natural gas sector climate review, that's RIN. 2060 AV16, and the second one, control of air pollution from new motor vehicles, heavy duty engine and vehicle standards, RIN 2060 AU41. I will work with the DFO to incorporate changes, and this will also be with Dr. Olmsted and possibly members of the work group, um, changes we've discussed for the SAB report on EPA's proposed revised definition of waters of the US. If you suggested a change, and you know we definitely took notes, but if you're preparing revised text, please send that to Tom Armitage by June 10th so that we have people's language in their own words and we'll try to uh, massage it into you know, a coherent whole. Uh, so please send Tom a, um, I'll ask Tom to send a follow-up to everyone so that we can um, you know, clarify anything that needs clarification after we hear from you. After that draft report is revised, we'll send it to you for final concurrence and then it would be transmitted to the EPA. I want to, before I give any other housekeeping tips, I just wanna say again, thank you so much to the WOTUS work group, certainly the chair, Sheila Olmsted, and the entire group, which we heard from across the two days, just a tremendous amount of work on behalf of all of us and really appreciate that. And thank all of the members of the board for digging in and, and raising their issues. That's just so helpful. That's when we work at our best. Uh, so the SAB staff office is planning to hold the next full board meeting in late July, and we anticipate conducting a couple of quality reviews of SAB reports at that meeting, so you'll hear more about that. Are there any additional questions from the board at this time? I just want to reflect that since we're not traveling to DC for these meetings, we've actually been able to meet a couple times within a few months and we'll be meeting again, you know, in not too long. And I think that is actually, although it's hard not to be in person, it is actually helping us remember from one meeting to another and be able to track some of those overarching issues and things that we're really trying to make progress on. Cause it's hard if you only can meet, you know, once or twice a year in person, even though you get to be together for a couple of days, I think this, this, it does have some benefits as well. So Again, thanks everyone and not seeing any questions, I will ask 
Tom Armitage, please, as the DFO to adjourn the meeting, but not before I say thank you so much to the SAB staff office, Tom Armitage, Tom Brennan as the chief, and all the members over there who are doing so much work behind the scenes. So thank you for supporting us. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all very much. I'd like to also thank you. And uh, just remind, remind you that uh, I will be reporting your meeting hours for this meeting. You should report your, your homework hours. And uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I will adjourn the meeting. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, all. Bye. 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 Bye.